morning. Everyone glad to be here? I am. <laughs> well, welcome and thank you for being here with us today for the Texas Alliance for Life Leadership Circle Luncheon. If everyone would please stand for our invocation today, given by former Texas Alliance for Life board member, Pastor Dr. David Smith, the Executive Director of the Austin Baptist Association. Will you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for this lunch that has been provided for us, and we pray your blessing over those that prepared it. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to celebrate life that we have, that God comes right in line with your, your own uh, agenda. Lord, I just pray your our gather. pray that you would give us wisdom and us to how we individually can be involved in this uh, crusade for life. God, bless our time. Bless this day. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So good to see you here today. Once again, I want to welcome everybody to our Leadership Circle members and their guests to the Texas Alliance for Life Leadership Circle Luncheon. And to those of you who are visiting with us or are listening in via live streaming, we're, we want to ex we're excited that you're here with us today and, and thank you for being with us. I'm Davita Steich and I'm the President and Chairman of the Board for Texas Alliance for Life. And I'd like to take just a moment to acknowledge the men and women of the Board of uh, Directors for Texas Alliance for Life. They work so very hard. Many of us don't get uh, any very little recognition, but this is a, a, a big part and component of Texas Alliance for Life. If you're a board member of Texas Alliance for Life, please stand so that we can thank you and welcome you. There are also some uh, other special guests and, and members that we have here today. And so I, I, would, I would like to recognize a few of those. First of all, we have State Representative Larry Gonzalez from House District 52. He's here with us today. Thank you for being here with us, Representative. <laughs> we also have Justice Melissa Goodwin from the Third Court of Appeals. Good to know, and a longtime supporter. We thank her for being here today. We also have a candidate for the Criminal Court of Appeals, Place 2. That's the Texas Supreme Court issue for criminal courts, and that is Patty, I'm sorry, Mary Lou Keel. And then there is Patty, who is a former state representative, uh, Patty Keel. She's here with us today. Thank her for being here. We also have with us newly elected uh, uh, House Representative from, I believe it's 55. Uh, he could not be here with us today. He's already working for that district, but he is here represented by his wife, Debbie Shine, uh, for uh, Hugh Shine. Thank you for being here. We also have a representative from Congressman Bill Flores' office, and that's uh, Brandon Seaman, who's here? Where are you? There you are, Brandon. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate Congressman Flores very much. Well, I know you want to hear an update of what's going on at Texas Alliance for Life. That's why we're here to, you know, we're here to see Senator Cornyn, but I would like to please welcome in and ask you to welcome our Executive Director, Dr. Joe Poyman. Well, welcome everybody. Wow, this is the best crowd we have ever had for, for this event, and I don't think you're all here to hear me speak, but maybe the next speaker. But my name is Dr. Joe Poyman. I'm Executive Director of Texas Alliance for Life. And if you are new to Texas Alliance for Life, let me explain that we are a statewide organization of people committed to protecting innocent human life from conception to natural death using peaceful legal means. And we've been doing that for 28 years. Yeah. 
And I want, to, I want to recognize my staff and thank them. Lance Peterson, our Director of Financial Development, back there. Ann Sterling, our Administrative Assistant. Aaron Groff, our Staff Attorney. Leah Brown, a Communications Assistant. And Deirdre Cooper, our Public Policy Analyst. Last month, I brought some of our board and staff to Washington, D.C. for the challenge to the pro-life House Bill 2 in the U.S. Supreme Court. Texas Alliance for Life provided a great deal of legal help to the uh, Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton. And at the request of his office, we filed an amicus curia brief, friend of the court brief, written by one of the most qualified attorneys in the nation who, whom we had hired, a former solic Solicitor General of Texas and former clerk of Justice Antonin Scalia. So we submitted that, and we think that's, that's a, a great help. Outside the court, there were two competing rallies going on while the court was hearing the arguments, one supporting House Bill 2 and one opposing House Bill 2. And I can tell you, you want to be with a crowd that was supporting House Bill 2, because some of the other crowd was not so nice. I was honored to be asked to speak at the pro-life rally and to stand up for our common sense law here in Texas. And we were in very good company. We had a number of national pro-life leaders. The Texas legislature passed House Bill 2 in 2013, as you recall, to substantially increase safety regulations at Texas abortion facilities. It's just common sense. The new regulations meet the standard of care for facilities, or I should say the new regulations raise the standard of care for, uh, for facilities that provide comparable procedures. So we're asking abortion providers to just raise their, their standard of care to the same level of places where you would go for other outpatient uh, medical procedures. Colonoscopy, dilation and curatage after a miscarriage, even cataract removal. And these, there are a lot of these facilities around the state of Texas, more than 400. So our question is, why should abortion facilities perform abortions at a lower, less safe health uh, standard than these other health care providers? It just doesn't make sense. Nevertheless, many abortion facilities have chosen to close rather than to meet these basic, basic safety standards. Now, opponents claim that the closures prevent women from exercising their right to abortion. Okay, these claims are greatly exaggerated for a couple of reasons. Number one, the facilities are, are, that have closed are within very close proximities to very large abortion facilities that do make the standards. Most, many of them run by Planned Parenthood. Okay, so, if, for example, in Austin, we have two abortion facilities. One meets the standards, one doesn't. If the one doesn't closes, they are, that is only a mile and a half from the one that does, which is a very large Planned Parenthood abortion facility, which a lot of you have been there praying, I'm sure. Um, the other reason is that, um, the other reason is that there are just, um, uh, many of the facilities that close are blaming on House Bill 2, but it's for entirely different reasons. And that was the point of our friend of the court brief, and I think we proved that very decisively for the court. So it is our fervent hope that the U.S. Supreme Court will allow House Bill 2 to fully go into effect as intended by the legislature. Regardless, you need to know that Texas Alliance for Life is in this for the long haul. We will not stop, we will not rest until every unborn baby and every pregnant mother in Texas is protected. If you got any of our emails or our mail voters guide or went to our website, you know that we recently had elections in Texas. And the candidates endorsed by our political action committee generally had a very good day on March 1st, the primary election.
Let me give you an example. Our PAC endorsed 36 contested state house races, of which 25 won their elections and three are in runoffs, meaning we're, we are batting an outstanding 75% average. <laughs> of those house races, of those house races, of, among the most watched was House District 121, in which pro-life pro Speaker Joe Strauss easily won an election, re-election against a heavily funded uh, opponent. Why do we like Joe Strauss? Because of all the many accomplishments we have had in Texas for the last six years, and the fact that we have worked with him and with his staff to help accomplish those. He's in this fight with us. In House District 8, Representative Byron Cook, the pro-life chairman of the House State Affairs Committee, and to whom we owe a great debt of gratitude for the passage of House Bill 2, because it came through his committee when he was chairman, and that was quite a feat to get that bill done properly. He defeated a challenger who outspent him three to one. His challenger spent $3.2 million. Byron Cook is coming back, and we had endorsed him. So we endorsed candidates in two contested state races, state, state senate races. One candidate won, and the other one's in a runoff. So, uh, and all of our endorsed candidates running for Congress were successful. So I want to, um, at this time I want to give a shout out to the seventh grade class at St. Louis Catholic School here in Austin, their social studies teacher, Mrs. Vivian Conway, their principal, Dr. Tina Juarez Bailey, and the pastor, Father James Misco. They are, um, there are 30 of them here. To hear Senator Corden, they're uh, studying social studies and this, they're studying Texas history right now. And I think they're extremely well behaved, so let's give them a real round of applause. Our future, our future pro-life leaders. And we so appreciate you members of the leadership circle who have made possible this critical work. Because without you, we could do nothing. And we thank you for bringing your guests. And you guests, we hope you'll consider joining our leadership circle, which you can do by filling out those cards on the table, and or going to our website. I just want to really thank you all so much because in Austin, you know, it's pretty rocky ground. And even in Texas, it's a tough slog from time to time. And the progress we have made, especially in the last six years has been outstanding. Um, they can't win, our opponents cannot win in the legislature anymore, so they go to the courts. And fortunately, we have a very good attorney general with very good staff, and uh, we are gonna do our utmost to protect, as I said, every one of these unborn children and their mothers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Poyman, and for all your hard work and the staff, very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Today we're honored, extremely honored, that United States Senator John Cornyn is our featured speaker for you today. Senator Corm Cornyn formerly served as Attorney General of the state of Texas, and I, that's where I began watching him as a, a person who was advocating for the unborn. Before that, he served as, the, as a justice for the Texas Supreme Court. Senator Cornyn is a senior senator from Texas and is the Senate Majority Whip. Huge leadership. We're so very proud of you, sir. His efforts and leadership were critical to the successful passage of the Pro-Life Reconciliation Bill, H.R. 3762, last December, which was the first time Congress defunded Planned Parenthood. Please welcome Senator John Cornyn. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction. I told Davida she knows how to get a standing ovation. Uh, well, when I, when I first heard from, uh, from Joe about this uh, luncheon, I thought, okay, this is April Fool's Day, right? 
But it's actually not an April Fool's joke. Uh, uh, I couldn't uh, be happier to be back here at home in Austin, my home since 1991. I'm a San Antonio boy. Uh, my dad served 31 years in the Air Force, but uh, Austin's now our, our home. So my wife Sandy and I, we, uh, as I was telling somebody earlier, we, I'm glad Southwest Airlines doesn't make us pay rent. Uh, <laughs> We're, we're on that great, uh, great direct flight, uh, it seems like once a week, twice a week, once there and once back. But it's really nice to, uh, to be back home and particularly nice to be here with, with you. And I'm glad, Joe, that you invited these students from St. Louis Catholic School and they are extraordinarily well behaved. And as I told them as we were meeting them, I said, uh, you know, I work for you. And they looked at me with big eyes. <laughs> They didn't, maybe didn't fully appreciate that, but I, I do. I, I appreciate the fact that I work for you and work for all 27 million Texans. And it's a great honor and a great privilege. I even told some of them that uh, I hold the Senate seat that was first held by Sam Houston. And they said, well, we're studying Sam Houston in Texas history. I said, yeah, Texas, Sam Houston, after uh, Texas got its independence, he was one of the first two United States senators. And I occupy the Senate seat that he first held in 1846. And those of you who've been in my office in Washington, D.C., see his picture over my credenza. Uh, it helps remind me of the profound responsibility and the, and the sense of history and the obligation that I have to do the very best I can to represent this great state. The Texas Alliance for Life has the mission, of course, in your own words, of changing hearts and saving lives. And your dedication to that cause has never been more important than it is today. And because the Supreme Court of the United States is considering legislation passed by uh, the Texas legislature and signed into law here in our state, the rest of the country is taking note of the leadership of organizations like Texas Alliance for Life and your impact on this process to further a compassionate pro-life agenda. And it gives this organization even a greater challenge and a much larger platform and opportunity. But I've been at this game long enough to understand that uh, things don't happen by accident. It takes leadership. It takes leadership. And I'm thankful to Dr. Poyman, who ably and skillfully works day in and day out to translate his and our vision into action. I know Joe introduced me to a number of the people he said he works for uh, in this organization, so I guess we all have bosses. I've got, I got a lot, I have a few more than you do, Joe, but, but, you, but we still have bosses. Sandy Cornyn's the number one boss. Uh, but Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. What an apt verse to help keep in mind what our mission should be and our, what our leadership role should be when the lives of the unborn are on the line. Dr. Poyman and his team and the supporters in this room have proven time and time again that the Texas Alliance for Life will not only defend the lives of our most vulnerable, but it will actually advance the cause to achieve results in an effective way. Let me say that again. We'll not only defend the lives of the most vulnerable, but we'll actually advance the cause to achieve results in an effective way. You know, it's, again, I've been in politics for a while, as you, as you heard, and I've seen all sorts of folks and uh, been in almost every imaginable situation. Uh, it's a lot of fun, never dull. But there is a huge difference between being effective, and just being loud. And they're not the same thing. Now, sometimes you have to be loud, and I'm happy to do that. And sometimes you know you're going to fight a fight that you're going to lose. But really, the ultimate goal is to be effective. And your hard work with the Texas Alliance for Life has made Texas one of the most pro-life states in the country and has set an undeniable example of how to protect those who cannot protect themselves, a noble undertaking, to say the least. And through your efforts and your influence, leaders like Governor Abbott, Governor Perry before him, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, and Speaker Strauss, and the Texas legislature 
people like my friend Larry Gonzalez and others who are here today, have made tremendous strides in the pro-life agenda, including at the state level, the defunding of Planned Parenthood, increasing funding for alternatives to abortion, and fighting for measures to defend life for vulnerable patients and to help victims of human trafficking. And I was encouraged to hear Dr. Porman talk just now about Texas Alliance for Life's goal to continue to make Texas a safe haven for all of our children. So thank you, Joe, and thanks to your team for your strategic vision and your proactive, proactive role in making sure that the, as the tip of the spear in this movement, uh, that we advance the cause of life for those who cannot defend themselves. And the truth is, in Washington, we're constantly having to fight this same fight, perhaps in even less hospitable territory. I frequently tell people that I'm honored to serve in that forward operating base in hostile territory <laughs> known, known as the nation's capital. And it's really not a joke. It's actually true. But I'm honored to do it, and I'm glad for each and every battle that we have the Texas Alliance for Life standing alongside us and supporting us and helping inform us and guide us and encourage us in that important fight. So let me just spend a few minutes talking about how the 114th Congress, that's the Congress that started a little over a year ago uh, when Republicans got the majorities of both the House and the Senate, what we've actually done. Now you would be forgiven, I will forgive you, if you're not aware of each and everything that we've done in Washington. Some of you, after hearing it, may not believe it. Some of you may have been distracted by the presidential primaries, and that's okay, that's okay. But I just do, I do want to uh, uh, talk about what we have done and what we've tried to do, what we need to continue to do to keep this president's pro-abortion agenda in check. Since assuming control of the Senate, Republicans in Congress have been able to achieve a more pro-life legislation, more pro-life legislation that, than at any other time in recent memory. And I know of our collective efforts to particularly protect those who are victims of sex trafficking, a heinous crime which the profile of a victim of human trafficking, as you know, is a young girl between the age of 12 and 14, usually a runaway, somebody who's looking for love and support only to find themselves subjected to modern day slavery. It's a horrible, horrible crime. And this is an area where there needs to be more awareness and greater involvement at all levels of government and in the non-government, the people like you who support that awareness effort, but particularly for local, state, and federal officials working together. Some of you remember a piece of legislation that uh, we passed last year called the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act we, we passed just last spring. I was honored to be the chief sponsor of that legislation. And it was really modeled off of my experience here in Texas as Texas Attorney General, where we administered the Crime Victims Compensation Fund. You know, money's always in short supply, but what we were able to do is use the money from fines and penalties for, victim, for people who were on the purchasing side of these practices and to use that as a fund to then help rescue and heal the victims. So it seemed like it made a lot of sense. But this law protects victims of human trafficking um, by providing them a safe place to stay. We have a lot of people with big hearts who want to help, but frankly not enough resources, and we expect, as a result of this legislation, the fines and penalties that will go into this compensation fund, that there'll be as much as $60 million a year available for grants to faith-based organizations, other non-governmental organizations who are trying to do the good work every day of rescuing these victims of human trafficking. So this will help not only those victims, it'll also provide more tools for law enforcement. And it'll punish those who want to keep folks in the shadows. And importantly, it'll make sure that these young women, typically, are treated as victims and not as the criminals in the first instance. This has been a sort of a culture change because if people are, are treated initially as a criminal when they are themselves a victim, then you're much less likely to get their cooperation and much less likely to be able to transition them into the sort of healing and the recovery mode that is so important. 
Legislation like this and that passed at the state level makes clear to the victims and to the predators who exploit them that we take this very seriously and that we value their lives. Perhaps people who wonder, does anybody care about them and their life? And that we will fight for them. But unfortunately, this is indicative of what the situation is like in Washington these days. In the middle of this fight for the victims of human trafficking, something everybody said that they believed in, we found ourselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a posture where Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Rights Action League were trying to erode the Hyde Amendment, which had been the law of the land since the late 70s. You'll remember the Hyde Amendment, named for Henry Hyde, a champion in the pro-life movement, created the firewall that said no taxpayer dollars are going to be used uh, to fund abortions. And I don't have to spell out to you how important this provision is. It is our firewall, as I said. And we will not let any taxpayer dollars go for the funding of abortions, period. It's a matter of conscience, and it's a matter of principle. Well, unfortunately, our Democratic friends, or as we call them in Washington, our friends across the aisle, Sometimes they don't act very friendly, but we still try to treat them as fellow citizens, even though we disagree with them um, vigorously. But unfortunately, Democrats threatened to scuttle the entire human trafficking bill because they saw an opportunity to roll back the Hyde Amendment, the law of the land for the last 35 years. Well, you know how it turned out. We stood firm, and we made sure that they understood we would not waver in our commitment to life. But more critically, we weren't in this fight alone. The voices of many groups across the state and across the nation rose up and put a lot of pressure on Democrats not to scuttle this consensus piece of human trafficking legislation just to try to relitigate and erode the Hyde Amendment. And, though, and thus, after about a month on the floor of the United States Senate, we were able to pass this bill 99 to 0. You'd And it was signed into law by President Obama. The blind obstruction, this lesson we, that I learned from this, is the blind obstruction from opponents is no match for those of us who are eager to see justice brought to the victims of human trafficking. And that included many of you, perhaps all of you here in this room. And that was a real victory, I think, at every end of the spectrum for survivors of sex slavery as well as the unborn. Unfortunately, in today's election year rhetoric, we see the other side now openly advocating for the repeal of the Hyde Amendment and advocating for taxpayer funding of abortions. And sadly, we see many of my colleagues in Congress on the other side of the aisle continue to drift further and further to those special interests who now see abortion on demand, fully funded by the taxpayers, as some sort of new right. Well, those are the folks who underestimate the impact of the grassroots pro-life movement. They ignore the shifting of public opinion as a result of our collective efforts in these battles. That shifting of public opinion, it is occurring in America these days, which shows more and more of our country supporting a culture of life. And they disregard the science that proves that life begins at conception and underscores how every child, even in utero, can feel pain. And now in the throes of an election year, we've got to continue to press for more, not less action on the pro-life agenda. But last year, we did more than just stop an erosion of the Hyde Amendment and the pro-life movement. Under Republican leadership, we did pass the uh, bill that defunded Planned Parenthood for the first time. Now, you may not have heard about that, but this is why we had to fight so hard to pass a budget in the first instance, you might ask, well, why is a budget so important? Well, a budget's important because through the budget resolution, you can actually pass legislation with 51 votes instead of the 60 votes that are typically required. And so we were able, by sticking together and by passing a budget and passing this reconciliation bill, to actually put the legislation on the president's desk. And of course, what motivated that action, it was the horrific and disgusting videos that we saw of Planned Parenthood executives callously describing the harvesting of fetal body parts. 
I know to every person of normal sensibility, this is just as repulsive as you can imagine and agonizing to watch. And they certainly don't represent what America stands for. But these videos did act as a long overdue wake up call for the country and helped refocus the pro life movement as nothing else could have on the need to protect the innocent and the vulnerable who need us to continue to speak on their behalf. So we were resolute and we were able to act and we were able to put that on the president's desk. Now, you know, the, sometimes people tell me, well, Senator, we sent you all to Washington to make things happen. And I said, well, I'm all for that. And said, you know, but we need you to beat President Obama when he vetoes legislation. I said, well, I'm all for that. Um, you know, show me 67 votes and we'll get it done. Uh, that's in the Constitution, of course. It says that's two-thirds vote need to override a presidential veto. So I'm, I share in your frustration, believe me, but I try not to let my frustration paralyze me or force me to quit the fight. And I know we were all disappointed, in, but not surprised when the president vetoed that bill. And I think it did prove another useful thing, and that is how desperately America needs a pro-life president who will actually listen to the American people. You know, it was a pro-life president, George W. Bush, who said the promises of the Declaration of Independence are for everyone, including unborn children. We need another president with those convictions. But until we have one, we've got to crystallize our long-term goals so that we don't settle on short-sighted symbolic actions that don't actually accomplish anything, to my point earlier. And we've got to work hard, we've got to work together, and we have to work smart. Fortunately, that was translated last year into taking unprecedented steps to help advance the cause. And while we weren't able to pass this legislation, it was incredibly important. In addition to passing legislation that defunded Planned Parenthood, we fought for the Pain Capable of Unborn Child Protection Act, a bill that would prohibit nearly all abortions after five months, and another called the Born Alive Survivors Protection Act, legislation that would require doctors to provide care for children born alive as a result of, uh, of incomplete or botched abortions. It is a sad commentary on the conscience of our country when we need a law that forces doctors to care for children that were born as a result of an abortion that didn't turn out the way they originally intended. But I was proud to co-sponsor both bills legislation that would not only save thousands of lives, but would be the biggest step forward in the pro-life movement since the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act that was signed into law a decade ago. And importantly, both are part of a long-term proactive strategy to make our country a nation that does prize life and does believe it's our obligation to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, the most vulnerable among us. So these bills aren't going away, nor is our determination to continue to pursue them. But now we've got to redouble our efforts and continue educating others about the common sense nature of these pieces of legislation. I know as Joe was talking about the uh, Supreme Court case and what the Supreme Court of the United States is being asked to decide, it makes so much sense what the Texas legislature did. I mean, I'll give you two words for why what the Texas legislature did was exactly the right thing. Kermit Gosnell. So we've got to redouble our efforts in, uh, in trying to upgrade health care facilities and to try to defend uh, the legislation passed by the legislature here in Texas and supported um, by our governor and signed into law. So that brings me perhaps to my last point, and that is the Supreme Court of the United States. You know, Justice Antonin Scalia was a, really a role model in so many ways for people like me as growing up in the Texas judiciary, having served for seven years on the Texas Supreme Court. Justice Scalia made the point time and time again that as long as the courts were looked at not as enforcing the written law or the words of the Constitution, 
But as long as courts were looked at as substituting their value judgments for the value judgments of the elected representatives of the American people, that people were always going to question the legitimacy of their decision. And indeed, we've seen the Supreme Court of the United States shift over time, not from interpreting a written constitution and written laws, but rather imposing their value judgments and calling it a new constitutional right. So I could not, in good conscience, when Justice Scalia passed away, agree to support President Obama appointing and the Senate confirming a Supreme Court justice for this lame duck president in the last year of his term of office. I could not do it. Because the next justice on the Supreme Court of the United States is going to change the balance of power on that court for the next 25 or 30 years. Justice Scalia served for 30 years. I've had the honor since I've been in the Senate to participate in the confirmation of Justice Roberts, Justice Alito. And I know not every judge, even those I generally agree with, are going to decide everything the way I exactly would like them to do. But then the President Obama's had the chance to appoint Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor. But fortunately, what's happened is the essentially balance on the court that existed when President Obama came into office has essentially been maintained. And so while many of the decisions that the court has decided I disagree with, um, it has not been a radical transformation of the Supreme Court, which it would be if President Obama was able to complete this nomination and the Senate were to take up and vote on this uh, nomination and confirm Justice Garland to the Supreme Court. So what we've said, which I think makes a lot of sense, we're in the midst of a presidential election. Republicans are picking our candidate. Democrats are picking their candidate. And what we'd like to do is to give the American people a voice on who gets to make that appointment to the next justice on the Supreme, for the next justice on the Supreme Court who will serve for 25 or 30 years. I think that's an important principle to abide by, and I wanted you to understand why I thought it was so important. And of course, the Constitution makes it very clear that it is the authority of the President to make the nomination, but that very same Constitution says that it is up to the Senate whether to grant or to withhold consent. And in this instance, we've simply decided to withhold that consent. So I'm proud of uh, my Senate colleagues against a bunch of press and media demonstrations you may have seen outside my office here in, in Austin and elsewhere, trying to get us to change our minds. But I promise you, we will stand firm, and we will not be confirming an Obama judge to the Supreme Court. So let me conclude with this. Let, let me just again express my gratitude to all of you for what you do. It's really, really important. I know many Americans are frustrated because they sit on their couches and they watch TV or they in their car listening to the radio and they're thinking, I don't recognize my country. We're heading in a direction that scares me and that challenges the very basic generational promise that my parents made to my generation, which is we're going to sacrifice, we're going to work hard, we're going to defend America because we want to make sure the next generation enjoys greater prosperity, greater opportunity, greater security than we, we ourselves had. That is really the sacred promise of one generation to another, and, and many, many people are feeling like that is increasingly in doubt. So while we are fighting an uphill battle in Washington, I assure you, we continue to covet your support, your friendship, your advice, and your prayers, and, uh, and the insight that the Texas Alliance for Life continues to give us in fighting these battles. And so often, it's, it's really a matter of, when I talk to Joe, for example, I'll say, well, the folks back home really understand what we're doing here? And so often the case is, well, Joe says in a very sort of, you know, respectful sort of way, said, well, maybe, we could, maybe you could do a little more to explain exactly what you're doing uh, because the message isn't getting out. But that's where we can work together and we continue to need your help. 
I've often said my role in the United States Senate is one of bringing the Texas success story uh, to the rest of the country, and I firmly believe that. That is still my goal. And where does it matter more than in the pro-life movement, where lives are on the line? So let me say again, thanks for your efforts, thanks for your friendship, and thanks for your support. And by working together, I'm hopeful that the United States of America can regain its historic role as a champion of the pro-life cause for the rest of the watching world. Thank you and God bless you. I'm so glad to have you here. And, and the senator has agreed to take some questions from the audience. So if, if you have a question you would like to ask, I'd like for you to you know, raise your hand. And then uh, if you would stand and, and uh, answer your question. Mr. Housen. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. And I, I, this won't surprise you, but I don't often agree with Nancy Pelosi um, and her characterization of what happened. I think what this is the omnibus appropriation bill at the end of last year. Is that correct? So we actually had a strategy to use the budget reconciliation process to order to lower the threshold from 60 votes down to 51 votes in order to get it on the president's desk which we actually were successful in doing. We actually collaborated with the Texas Alliance for Life on that strategy. Um, the, the problem was, as you know, because the Democrats blocked all of the appropriation bills last year, we were rapidly approaching the end of the fiscal year, and the only way to keep things going, to keep the government running, was to pass an omnibus appropriation bill. I've called that an ominous appropriation bill. It's an ugly terrible way to do business. But the alternative is, is to fail to fund the operation of the government, including the military and everything else. And yes, there was, uh, I disagreed with uh, the funding of Planned Parenthood. I don't think anybody can possibly look at my record and suggest otherwise. And unfortunately, I think some of our friends you know, use this as an occasion to divide us when actually we were united. Uh, we passed the budget res resolution that gave us the reconciliation instruction, which gave us an opportunity to defund Obamacare, excuse me, Planned Parenthood and Obamacare with 51, 51 votes. We did that with 52 Republicans voting for it. So I, I confess that it gets a little confusing at times, and particularly when we have some of our own allies and friends sort of uh, you know, beating each other up, when in fact I think we ought to keep our eye on the people who are not pro-life I mean, Nancy Pelosi, she's, she's opposed to the limitation on late-term uh, partial birth abortion, 
a horrific, barbaric practice. So these are not these folks are not on our side. We're not on their side. And I know that it gets a little confusing sometimes when you see the, the, all the tactics that are being employed, but I assure you my goal was to try to ultimately pass that reconciliation bill to put the defunding of Planned Parenthood on the President's desk. I certainly didn't agree with funding Planned Parenthood. I would defund them in a minute. I think it's interesting that the three senators that you mentioned are also in a, were in a Republican primary process for the President of the United States, so it's very political. Thank you for the question. Yes, ma'am. You're not even holding hearings. They don't care if you confirm him. They think you should, quote, do your job and hold the hearings. I'm wondering why you didn't keep that up. Well, I don't see the point of having hearings or having meetings. I don't see the point of having hearings or meetings with a judge if I've already decided that I will not vote to confirm this judge. That's sort of the bottom line. That's the why. You know, how we get there, I think it would be a little misleading for me to greet the judge in my office, say, hey, judge, how are you doing? You know, good to see you. You know, get ready for the hearings, and we do have this, have this uh, back and forth at the hearings. But the real reason is, I think, and you've already begun to see this a little bit, that some folks who originally said, yes, we're not going to vote to confirm the judge, are now changing their minds. And it's a slippery slope. And I think it would be a travesty for us to confirm uh, Judge Garland, who I think is probably a pretty decent human being. But um, we're standing on the principle that the voters should have that chance to make that uh, decision by selecting the next president. By the way, that really, really raises the stakes because it's not just this one vacancy. The next, just, next uh, Supreme Court, uh, excuse me, next president is probably going to get a chance to fill three or more vacancies on the Supreme Court. That scares the living daylights out of me, which says we better get our act together and get behind somebody who can actually win, and so we can have somebody who's pro-life making, uh, making those appointments. Thank you. Let's see, I think we have time for... I think I turned... No, I didn't. I did, I did okay. Is there someone else you'd rather... Go ahead. Oh, okay. It, de it, de it depends if he's long-winded or not, you know. I'll try to be short-winded. Cinder, thank you for being here, and we appreciate all the pro-life things that you do for us. We had an interesting resolution come out of our Senatorial um, District Resolutions Committee last Saturday, and that was that rather than confirming any federal judges for life, that they be confirmed for X number of years, and then that they must go through a reconfirmation process. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Given the longer lives that we have nowadays, what do you think? I, I, kind, of, I kind of like the idea. You know, I mean, Diane, I was, as you know, I was a judge for 13 years, and actually I wrote a law review article talking about the differences between, for example, how we select judges in Texas, Judge Keel, and uh, which obviously is by political partisan elections. And, you know, there's places like Missouri, where you have so-called Missouri plan, where the governor appoints a commission who nominates individuals, and they then stand for election, and uh, and then their retention elections. In other words, they're not person against person. It's do you vote to retain Judge Cornyn on the ballot? And then there's the the federal system where we have lifetime tenure. But I think as judges in the federal courts have become seen seen more as political, and less as lawyers enforcing the written law then people are saying, well, I, guess, I think we the people ought to have more of a voice in who uh, that judge is, because if we're going to have somebody who's got lifetime tenure who serves on the, uh, on the federal courts and they're going to act just as another politician wearing robes, then maybe we ought to have, shouldn't have lifetime terms. Maybe we should have tenure terms and reconfirmation. I think that's a fascinating idea. I certainly would be willing to explore it. It would, of course, take a constitutional amendment 
which means that uh, it would take uh, two-thirds of, the, of the, both houses and three-quarters of the states to ratify that constitutional amendment. So that's the, that's the challenge. But I think that's a discussion worthy of having. Out in the hallway. <laughs> anyway, I think we can do one more. Quick, quickly. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you knew that was coming, I'm sure. <laughs> I wish we'd cut the right before this. You wanted the question. As tough as the questions were, I mean, it, uh, no. I, I will just tell you what, what's obvious, and that is that the last primary elections are going to be on June the 7th, I believe. If no, no, no candidate has 1,237 delegates, then you go to convention in Cleveland. Then they have the first ballot. And my understanding is that all of the delegates will be committed to vote in accordance with what happened in their state's primary election, whether it's proportional or all of the above. So I'm assuming that that means whatever the leading candidate has on June the 7th, that will be roughly reflected in the first round of votes on the uh, first round of votes. Subsequently, candidates or uh, delegates will not be bound to vote for the person who won the primary in their state. That's where I think it's going to get really, really, really interesting. I personally don't despair about that. I think this is what self-government is all about. What I think freaks a number of people out is saying, well, this is going to be on TV 24 hours a day, and, you know, who knows what, how this will turn out. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I would say for my political party, the Republican Party, we don't have superdelegates. We don't believe in sort of the elite in the Republican Party choosing the nominee for our party. We believe that the voters should make that choice, and that's what's happening. It just happens to be a little bit more unpredictable than any of us might have guessed. Everything I thought I knew about about elective politics has pretty much been proven wrong so far. So I don't know how it's going to turn out, but it's going to be okay. That's my prediction, and certainly my prayer. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you being here. And everybody else, great questions, in, uh, even the hard ones. Uh, and and I'm, our elected officials are absolutely happy to answer those. Now I'd like for you to welcome to the stage from the Board of Directors, the Chairman of the Finance, Financial Development and the Texas Alliance for Like Director of Finances, Financial Development, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Um, my, I, I have 10 pages of notes take me but an hour to get through these. So, in all seriousness, I, the, um, the children here want their picture taken with Senator Cornyn, so we're going to, that's why I marched them all over there, so they wouldn't be causing problems in the hall. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a little quick report on the uh, leadership circle, which is what I always do for you guys because I want you to understand, the board of directors wants you to understand the importance of what you do. Um, we started this in 2006 and uh, for those of you who are guests, um, since 2006 we've raised 2.4 million dollars just through the leadership circle. <clears throat> And what this has allowed us to do, and if you've been at these luncheons before, you hear the same thing over and over again, but repetition is the key to helping everybody understand why we're where we are. If you look at the way Texas Alliance for Life has expanded with the staff and all the things that Joe Poinman is able to do now with his staff, um, that's because of you guys. That's because you put in place a system 
that allowed us to hire the equivalent of six full-time people. So pat yourself on the back. <clears throat> now I'd like to call Lance Peterson, our development director up here, because he's going to talk to you about some very important events coming up. But what I want you to do is mark your calendars for October 5th of this year, which is our dinner. And we're going to have, as a speaker, David B. Wright with 40 Days for Life. That's going to be very exciting. And I'd love to bring Aggies into this town. So <clears throat> this is Lance Peterson. He's going to talk to you about the walk. Hey, I was told not. There we go. Thanks, everybody. Um, our Walk for Life is coming up on Saturday, June 25th. It's real important. It's part of our grassroots development. Um, we take the Walk for Life into the community, North Austin, South Austin, Georgetown, and Cedar Park. Um, it's a great way for people who may be new to pro-life. Maybe they've heard about it at their church um, or through Knights of Columbus. And um, it gives them that comfort level to come out and participate, go for a very easy little walk in the park. Um, and help us raise money for the moms and the babies. So if you can look on your tables or maybe outside in the lobby, you'll see a brochure that looks like this. Um, this is the form. We'll have an online version. We'll have a, a version on the website. But you can gain, you can go out and get sponsors uh, for the Walk for Life. And of course, that's very, very important. It's also our second largest fundraiser. And it's very um, effective as well as efficient. So Saturday, June 25th. And if you can also look on your table, there's a white card that says Walk for Life promotion. It's a kind of a half-page half size. If, if you could help us by promoting this at your, through talking to the pastor, uh, your Respect Life Committee, um, Knights of Columbus, maybe your Bible study, and, or just yourself. We'd love it. Sign that form out. Give it to me afterwards. Or leave it on the table. We'll come pick it up, and we'll definitely call you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lance. Um, guests do we have here today? Raise your hand, please. Okay, we have a lot of guests. So I would thank you for coming. We, we would suggest that if you like what you see here today, that this is an opportunity for you to join us in the leadership circle. There's a white card on your, on your table that looks like this that has, it's from our dinner, but it has the different levels of leadership circle membership. Um, and we would encourage you and whoever brought you to sit down and talk to you about this because this is a wonderful way to support this wonderful organization and to support the pro-life pro cause. The more people we have doing this, the bigger impact Joe and his leadership team that goes into the legislature can have on the legislature. So with that said, you can also talk to me after the event or Lance Peterson. I want to give you one other issue and then I'm done. And that is how many of you feel when you go talk to somebody about pro-life that you really don't have all the tools you need to change the subject to a positive light. How, how many, raise your hand if you ever have that problem. Okay. How many of you have a phone? Okay. And I preset this, but if you were to go to texasallianceforlife.org on your phone, it's going to give you all the tools you need to become a super pro-life agent. And um, also what you'll find is that Joe Poinman gives updates on, on our website as well as through emails. So this is a great resource for you to go to to figure out what's going on, what you can do, and how you can help other people be in the same situation that you are, the same boat. All right? So take out your phones and check that out. <clears throat> With that said, I'd like to thank John, Senator Cornyn, for coming today and for giving us the wisdom that you bring from Washington. Um, I did hesitate on that, didn't I? 
Uh, we want to thank each and every one of you for supporting the Leadership Circle and the Texas Alliance for Life. And our next event will be in August. Um, and uh, we are really thrilled to have you here today. And again, thanks for coming. So we're, we are finished for today. Thank you. Thank you.